Once you have the tax, that should be your sole policy. You can't say we're going to have a tax and at the same time we're going to ban this, that and the other and tell the farms and the auto industry and consumers how to operate. Everywhere we go, we can't help but consider how much everything will cost. It affects every single decision of our day. So what's the role of big government in our economy and do they have the track record to do that well? To answer this and more, I'm happy to welcome Matthew Lau, who holds a degree in commerce, years of experience in the banking industry, and whose popular columns can be seen regularly in the Financial Post. Stay tuned to hear how supply and demand control the prices of goods and how you can take back control of where your money goes. Today, a special episode of Return to Reason, where knowledge and wisdom intersect. All right, Matthew, it is so good to have you on Return to Reason. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Well, one of the, when, when it come, came up to this topic and understanding inflation and cost of living and the government's role, um, you are quite diverse in, in your covering it. And so uh, I just want to ask you, what is it that you think, why is it you think Canadians need to know about this and, and why do we have to address these topics? Well, I think there's a lot of uh, misconception around inflation and how best to tackle it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that uh, misconception is the result of um, governments that may often cause inflation while trying to tell you that they're trying to lessen it. Yeah. So one of my favorite examples is um, government spending programs. So if you go to the federal budget, for example, and they will tell you that they are trying to provide inflation relief. And one of the ways they might do that is by providing um, increased payments to seniors or government subsidization of child care and this, that, or the other program. Yep. The problem is that government spending is inflationary. Yeah. And when government splashes money around like this, that's one of the things that drives up prices. Um, so I think it's important to talk about inflation and what's really causing inflation. Well, let's, and, before uh, we get there, what, yes. what's the problem with inflation? Let's just start there. Inflation is really when... Um, uh, the, the standard definition is that uh, prices are rising and it's generally because you have too much money chasing too few goods. Yes. And, and when prices rise, it makes things uh, less affordable for families. Mm -hmm. So, for example, one of the ones that gets talked about a lot is um, food prices are getting more expensive. Gasoline is getting more expensive. Yeah. Um, child care is getting more expensive. If you look at the total cost, it might be cheaper. Um, the out-of-pocket cost might be cheaper, but we're paying more of it through taxes. Um, so when things become more expensive, um, the standard of living declines. And you, you, you can notice, like, I don't think anyone in our nation would disagree. Like, and the thing that's, I think, the most unfortunate thing about it is the people at the lowest end of the tax bracket pay the, pay the biggest price. They're the ones... Where, uh, like, I'm in, currently in Winnipeg right now. The ga gas is a dollar sixty-five. Like, I've ne I couldn't have ever imagined. And so, wages just can't seem to keep up with it, and nor can companies keep up with it at all. And so, um, okay, so so back to initially what you were saying, where the government says, in the name of trying to save you all, we'll just print some more money and send it off your way, and that's a problem. Right, exactly. So when the government subsidizes something, they off they often say, well, we're making it cheaper, we're making it more affordable. Yeah. And the, and the, um, the reality is they're absolutely not. Um, I've never heard of government um, really making things cheaper. They can try to hide the costs yeah. Yeah. or they can, you know, shift the cost from one person to another or from one place yeah. to another. But at the end of the day, in order to have things um, cheaper and to have things more abundant and to raise our standards of living, we need to be more productive. And I've never heard of the government, a uh, government program or government managing an industry in order to make it more productive. That's unheard of, yeah. right? The government is not making the childcare sector, for example, more efficient by subsidizing it. It doesn't make food or farmers, yes. yeah. um, their operations more efficient by trying to control or subsidize how farms work. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, how... If you were the government, what would you do, though? Like, you know what I mean? So, like, what are their actual choices there in trying to bring relief? Because I, I, I want to play the advocate a little bit, because if you are the, the little man, that the, the person who's at the bottom and just can't, doesn't have a choice, what do they do? 
So like, which is why programs like even just minimum wage, on the surface level, you're going, thank you. Like, thank you for raising minimum wage. But I think it's much, if you extrapolate that, the price to pay for that is maybe another employee losing their job. And so what, what's your... What, well, the problem is, is it's really a problem of poverty then. If you're looking at people who um, can't afford, you know, food or they, they need to um, raise their standards of living above a certain baseline, that's really a problem of poverty. And the problem or, or the solution to addressing poverty is to very directly address it by transferring, for example, funds to low income people. It wouldn't be to have a, you know, a subsidization of an entire sector or a government regulation oh, yeah, that affects an saying. entire sector yep. Yep. or a minimum wage. For example, most minimum wage earners are not from poor families, so it's very badly targeted. And the problem is then um, many studies have shown that um, when you raise the minimum wage by making labor more expensive, less of it will be demanded by employers. And, and so there was actually a, a very recent study from the, um, National Bureau of Economic Research mm -hmm. that uh, dispelled the myth that um, minimum wages can reduce poverty. And and what, it's it's just the two problems I've described. One of them is that you're going to cut the um, very lowest skilled workers out of the labor market. Yeah. And the second one is for those workers that who do see their wages go up, um, they're generally not from poor families in the first place. Why would it dispel the lowest skill set workers? Can you explain that? Well, um, so the the labor market is competitive, mm -hmm. right? So the problem is once you say you you have to raise the minimum wage, let us say in Ontario, it's going mm -hmm. to sixteen fifty or some somewhere in that neighborhood later wow. this year. Yeah. And the problem is anybody whose skills do not allow them to produce for an employer yeah. sixteen yeah. fifty worth of of output an hour is not going to be able to find a job unless that employer is willing to lose money by hiring them. Exactly, actually. Yeah, and, and it goes back to even what I said before, I guess. If you could only afford two people at 14, and now you're being forced at 17, well, I'm going to pick what I believe is the better one, I guess. That's, that's, you just made me realize that. <laughs> yeah. It's exactly that. You're totally right, yeah. And, and there, have, there have been um, lots of studies that have shown that, um, you know, the, the people who get um, cut out of the labor market are um, minorities, youth, immigrants, yeah. people with um, the the least amount of skills that are um, the least amount of skills and the least amount of experience. Yeah. And so, if employers have to say they have to pay a higher wage for them, they they might not want to take that chance. Yeah. No, it makes total. It makes absolute sense. So you're saying if you were in the government, you would they're trying to maybe solve the problems with too broad of a stroke and rather it, it's actually a poverty problem and not a social problem of trying to solve the economy's problem with a minimum wage raise, say. Would you say, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. The problem is we have a lot of untargeted policies and mm -hmm. if you want to help poor people, you need to be very targeted in helping them. You can't just spray money around everywhere. There's actually, um, it's a very interesting theory. It's called a director's law of economics. Um, and it's named after Aaron Director, um, who was an American economist. And he basically said, when the government tries to control more of the economy or transfer money from certain people to another or implement new programs, generally the people who will benefit from all of these programs are people who are not poor. Because people who are not poor don't have political power. Um, you know, it's it's the same skill set that gets you more economic power, that gets you more political power. So, for example, um, people who write newspaper columns, people who work in the universities, people, yeah. um, you know, who have a lot of influence and who are going to get um, government programs that benefit them, yeah. they're not the poor people. Yeah. So most government programs end up not helping the poor. They'll take from the rich because they have a lot of money. And they'll give to the middle who have a lot of political power and they won't give to the poor because the poor don't have any political power. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. During COVID, they released payments to people. It's called CERB. What, what I saw during that was actually everybody and their dog applying for it. Like it was just everywhere. And, and the people that, in my opinion, there's so many people that I saw that shouldn't have. And, but, but at the same time too, there, there was no real policing on it. And it, it, it kind of actually made 
like we're going to be paying this off for four or five generations to come, if, if not, maybe more. And the price to pay for it is just so huge. Right. The COVID price was very big. Now, now COVID is slightly different because not all of those programs were strictly poverty relief. Yeah, yeah. Some of it is if you lock down somebody's business, you have to compensate them, whether they're rich, yeah. poor or anything in yeah. between. So there is um, COVID is a, a bit of a special case, but I think yeah. there is um, a very strong case to be made that the government spent way too much money in COVID yeah. and did it very poorly. You mentioned earlier about um environmental policies on restricting goods and services and where the government rolls in that. But you had an article about that. Um, what was going on in that, that video? Right. So there was a video that, uh, you know, was widely viewed as, uh, I think it was several months ago about I, seen, uh, yeah. a dairy farmer that had to dump many thousands of liters of milk. And what is going on here is that um, in gov uh, the government has a program in place called supply management. And so the agricultural output in Canada is basically managed and limited by the government in order to keep the prices of farm goods up. So um, in the name of, you know, um, keeping farm prices stable and keeping farmers income stable, they want to basically inflate the prices um, by restricting the output of a lot of farm outputs like milk and poultry. Yeah. And, um, the consequence of that, of course, is that um, farms become less productive and we all pay more for groceries to the tune of several hundreds do of dollars more uh, per year yeah. per person. Supply and demand, right? That's just basic economics 101. Too much supply, yeah. low price. Too much, not enough supply, you got high price. So where, where is the line on that? Now, the, the reason I say that is it's when you look at it through the eye of like a, a free people outside of government structure. Well, we just want to make the most so everybody can have the most and we all live a great life. But when you're yep. looking at it through a business owner who's putting their life on the line and working their, themselves to the bone to just try to make the best product, get the most profits and pay the most. And it, like, so do they want to put out more or do they want a higher price? What, what is the farmer's perspective on it? And then also, if I was a farmer and I was just a small farmer, but you were a major farmer and you could produce a thousand times more than me. I would eventually have to go out of business to the big guy in town. Right. Now, the, the, the entire point of the economy and the entire point of businesses is to produce things that people demand and want to yeah. consume. Mm -hmm. That's how we raise our standard of living. Now, in theory, I don't know if this is really the case in practice, but in theory, if, yeah. if it was much more efficient to produce food only on big farms, we really only should have big farms. <laughs> we don't need to subsidize the little guy. Good and the little guy, um, I mean, it, it has always been the case in, in order to have economic progress, yeah. um, people have to find new jobs and new roles. And there's always that amount of churn. For example, if you go back, um, you know, 100 years, 200 years, mm -hmm. a lot more people worked on farms and it took a lot more people, um, you know, to feed the population. And as, as the economy progressed, we have a more service-based economy. We have a wealthier economy. We produce a lot more things in our economy now Absolutely. than just food yep. because we don't, you know, we have, we can produce uh, all sorts of things that are not necessities, whereas yes. before we were only focused on producing necessities. Yep. And the result of that is a lot of people over the years on farms have had to lose their jobs as yep. they, you know, Maybe they went into factories, maybe they went into the service economy, but that's always how the economy is always changing and the economy is always progressing. And that's how over time our standards of living rise. Yeah. So I wouldn't, you know, when you're looking at a little farm and a big farm or a little business and a big business, mm -hmm. it's, I think it's an error to try to, you know, keep something alive that's not really producing. Um, we have to free up those resources in order to have a more productive and a more vibrant economy and in order for the economy to progress and grow. Totally. And, and I guess what you're saying there, correct me if I'm wrong, please do, is the government's policies are actually almost allowing unproductive things to exist, which halts the progression of the economy. Is that right? Well, that's exactly right. And in the case of supply management, um, they are actively restricting the output. They're restricting production, deliberately keeping wow. production down. Yeah. So that is, you know, it, it is very clearly um, a drag on the economy and it, uh, 
uh, you know, in, in the sh very short run, it does, you know, protect some farmers and help some businesses stay alive, as you say. Yeah. But in the long run, um, we all pay for it. One of the misconceptions I find with the socialist style programs, um, I saw a video a while ago of Jim Carrey going on and bragging about our medical system up in Canada. And, and I went, I was floored. Like I wanted to go on there going, have you ever gone to an emergency room? Have you ever had a real emergency issue that you've had to deal with in Canada? Now, of, there's of course benefits. And of course, the, like there's free coverage for all. And, 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 and I've heard all the arguments, I've had them all. But when you need something done and you need it done in an emergency, the private sector will solve that problem a thousand times quicker. Yes, there's a cost, but the private sector brings the privilege of you being able to sometimes save your life. It's just That's wild. absolutely true. And, and you can see um, in the statistics a lot, tens of thousands or, or maybe several hundreds of thousands of Canadians every year mm -hmm. travel out of the country in order to get health care because you can't get it in this country in a timely fashion. Yeah. Um, now, the United States has their own problems with health care, and, and yeah. it's a mess down there. Yeah. Uh, but one of the problems they do not have is with uh, waiting times. Yeah. Now, to me, the problem with um, the medical system is you have the government taking control of an entire sector. Yeah. Um, and it's in the name of, um, you know, making sure everybody can afford or has access to a certain level of care. Now, to me, this comes back to the poverty problem. If you want people to access a certain level of care or a certain oh. level of, you know, anything, it's really you want to solve poverty. Mm -hmm. You don't really want a government takeover of an entire sector in the name oh. of, you know, helping the poor. That's mm -hmm. just a very bad way of doing it. And uh, the government uh, has made a mess of health care. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely has. And um, I don't even know if there's a clear road. <laughs> to fixing it. I don't know. Like Paul, I would imagine policy and discussion and voting appropriately. And that's why these conversations are important. Uh, but sometimes it almost feels helpless. It almost feels like there's just no ability to change it. But, but we've got to. We've got to continue to talk about it all. That's absolutely correct. And, uh, you know, there, there, some governments have made some marginal improvements in healthcare. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I think it's a very good thing that the Ontario government um, is allowing you to get an expanded amount of treatment still paid for out of the public purse, but they're ex allowing more private provision of health care. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's a very good thing, but that's only a marginal, um, yeah. a marginal change. I think really you need to scale back uh, the amount of government control of health care mm -hmm. um, in a very dramatic way before you have any real improvement. Well, and it'll exponentially benefit the public sector um, because it, as people, as the system's relieved, you know, what I mean? as you pull people out of the public sector and they go to private, they're, they're both going to win. You're going to have people who are running businesses excelling and winning and gaining profits as well as relief from the public. So it, it's, it, yeah. it, it, just it, makes it is sense. one of the, it is one of the, um, I guess you could say insane things about our healthcare system is we have a lot of people in in Canada who have foreign credentials to be doctors mm -hmm. yeah. oh, um, and yeah. they want to practice and they're perfectly good doctors yeah. and the government just won't hire more doctors because the government doesn't want to pay for more doctors. We only have a very limited amount of roles. And then you have people who want to see a doctor and who are willing to pay to see a doctor out of their own pocket, even though they've already paid taxes. Why can't those people who want to pay to see a doctor pay to see the doctors who yeah. aren't being allowed to practice? It's nuts. Okay. Can you bring but clarity to that? Have... Are you saying there's like a quota for the nation of Canada that the, the government's just saying, nope, we're done, can't hire anymore? Is well, that what you're saying? Kind of. Well, for example, well, the government does, you know, uh, have a very strict control mm -hmm. over um practice of medicine, right? They do control, for example, the hospital's budgets. They control the number of um, residencies, uh, you know, the number of residencies um, for uh, newly trained doctors. Um, the government will have regulations, for example, after you get your training, um, where are you allowed to practice? For example, if somebody has just um, received their training overseas and they come back to Canada, 
Um, the government may have a regulation about you need to, you know, you have to go to an underserved community to practice. So um, because Gosh. the government, right, because because it, the government is always afraid. It sounds valiant, but also at the same time, too, it's not like if you or I were a doctor, would would you take the short end of this deal? Like, or would you go to the U.S. and get paid for your skill set? You know, you know what I mean? It's it, it, in the in the umbrella of maybe people who aren't thinking critically on this, you might think, well, yeah, that's great. The under undervalued community can get a great doctor, but the doctor might not even do it. And, and that's the problem is that they might go elsewhere and then the people ultimately pay the price for it. Whereas if we had a competitive private sector and, and we were uh, allowing it to grow, you would have public and private both supporting each other. Oh, that's wild. Yeah, the the command and control system uh, just never works because yeah. the government doesn't know, um, you know, which, which, um, what type of care might need to be provided, where that type of care needs to be provided. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's the the basic uh, problem with the government organization of industry, right? Is that the government just doesn't have the information in order yeah. to plan all of the economic information in the economy. Uh, is held by individuals. It's held yeah. at the bottom level. Yeah. And that's why the economy works best and makes the most use of information when you put individuals in command yeah. and let them make their own decisions as opposed to have the government try to control everything. How would you say that that practically happens? In most sectors of the economy, we have a relatively free economy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like for all the complaining about food prices, anybody can open up a grocery store, anybody can yeah. go work at a grocery store, yeah, you know, the farm output is is very controlled, but, uh, you know, mo most of the things in our economy yeah. uh, are relatively free. If you look at the things where um, goods and services are becoming cheaper, you see yeah. electronics, um, you know, televisions, cars, maybe not uh, in, in the last few years, but over the long run, certainly so cars. A, a free market. Like, you know, and, yeah. and you can include medical in that, like a free market that is essentially supporting itself. Um, you mentioned that farming was extremely governed. Now, there's you mentioned uh, in some of the research I've done on you is you talk about environmental social governance. And um, can you expand on that? What What is it? And just what is it, I guess? <laughs> yes. Well, so, so the, um, the popular acronym these days is ESG, right? Oh. Environmental, social and governance. And that what that basically is, is when um, businesses um, often at the... Um, urging of governments or as a result of government regulation uh, turn their focus towards solving environmental or social problems. Mm -hmm. And the problem about that is that um, I think it's one of the um, main insights of modern economics where Adam Smith said, you know, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher that uh, and the brewer and the baker that we have our dinner. It's with regard to their own self-interest, right? The economy works best when businesses are, are laser focused on how best to innovate in order to solve problems for yeah. consumers and to um, um, make things better and cheaper uh, and, and get as many consumers and customers as possible to earn as much profit as possible. Yeah. You know, the, the um, economic growth and the level of prosperity we enjoy today yeah. is not the results of businesses trying to solve social problems. Yeah. It's the result of businesses trying to earn profits. And in that, they um, create a lot of economic surplus for employers, mm -hmm. for investors, for employees, um, for consumers. And that's where our standard of living really comes from. That I couldn't have actually said it any better, <laughs> any better myself. Um, so, uh, sorry, I just want to get a little clarity on that. Is the, the environmental social, the ESG, do they essentially have it for each sector of the farming world like there's heavy governance on them all and how does how does that governance work well if you want to look at um, the farm sector in particular i think it's the the main issue there is that the government is forcing um, standards and environmental standards on yeah. the um, on the farm sector that just don't make a lot of sense. So when they're, when they're enforcing it, are they enforcing output or you're talking about actually how they achieve their output, like the way they're farming? Well, for example, um, the government wants to um, regulate the um, fertilizer use of farmers in order to reduce oh, carbon see. emissions. Okay. Yeah. 
right? And and the prob and the problem with that is they're trying to make farms more environmentally responsible or trying to put the burden of solving an environmental problem okay, on farms. Yeah. And that may not be a very good way of doing it. Um, if you look at, um, you know, if you try to do a cost benefit analysis of how much more are the farms going, um, how much more in costs are farms going to incur um, oh, okay. in order to produce a certain unit of food while using less fertilizer, mm. you know, how much is that going to cost versus how much benefit uh, to the environment is there? I don't think um, imposing very strict regulations on how farms operate I get is a sensible way. Yes. I, I get what you're saying now because, the, the like, and this is why I think sometimes they're worded strategically, is when you look at its surface level, you're going, more environmentally friendly farm. I'll vote yes for that. Uh, like, of course we get that. So I get what you're saying. You're saying yes, but at the price of driving costs up, making it harder for the farmer, um, so on and so on and so on, which ultimately falls on you and I, the consumer, and we pay the price for it, which we can't afford, and then, we, and then the, the problem just continues to go down the ladder. Right. So to me, the environmental problem is very similar to the poverty problem, where if you mm -hmm. want to address it, you need to address it very directly. Yeah. You can't have a lot of government programs um, that are very broad and that impose, um, that take the decision away from the individual yeah. and, and you know, impose lots of um, government control over industries as to how they operate. That's just a very um, untargeted and, um, you know, it's like you're taking a, a hammer to a problem yeah. um, that, uh, you know, you don't really need to take a hammer to. It's, it's, it's like you have a nail here and you're hammering all around the nail in order to try to hit that nail. Yeah. And you're going to, you know, end up breaking a lot of things if you if you try to do that. And that's what the government uh, does with a lot of its programs. So what do you suggest they could do maybe to, to like, is there a win-win here? Can they be environmentally friendly? Or maybe you're saying it's up, it's up to us as the free citizens to solve the environmental problems. Like, what would you say? Because we, we do need to keep those costs low. But what else? What's our another choice? So the standard um, case, now different environmental problems mm -hmm. have um, different environmental solutions. Now, yeah, the big exactly. environmental problem that is often talked about today is climate change. Yeah. And it's generally the case, and, and most economists will say, and I think they're right, is that um, the best or the most targeted way to solve the greenhouse gas problem is to just put a tax on greenhouse gases. Once you have the tax, that should yeah. be your sole policy. You can't say we're going to have a tax and at the same time, we're going to ban this, that, and the other and tell the farms and the auto industry and consumers how to operate. Yeah. That just destroys the entire logic of the tax in the first place. Yeah. And, the, and the second issue with the tax is um, because our economy uh, needs greenhouse gases in order to be productive, um, a carbon tax is sort of like an income tax. Yeah. Um, and in order to reduce the economic harm of this carbon tax, which it acts like an income tax, you need to scale back the income tax, whether it's personal income or corporate yeah. income. That's how um, most economists will say you want to deal with climate change. Yeah. But you've brought a lot of insight here, I think, to, <laughs> to many different questions. And I'd, honestly, I'd love to have you on again sometime, possibly, where we could flesh out more ideas. because. It just affects us all so greatly here in, what, in the topics of inflation and money and the government's role and medical. And um, oh, it's, it's really been great. So I appreciate you, Matthew, for joining us on today's program. And uh, uh, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. You are an essential part of this series. Support truth, knowledge, and wisdom by sharing this show with a friend. Visit returntoreason.tv. There, you can subscribe to our newsletter by clicking Become an Insider. Get the latest articles, episodes, and exclusive content. It's Return to Reason.